a rapid paced discussion around the importance of the middle class. We are awaiting the minister who is in the middle of a press conference, but uh, the forum has asked us to go ahead and commence without him. Uh, let me just make a couple of introductory comments. We are absolutely all seeing how the shift to manufacturing in emerging markets, how the resource and mineral riches in emerging markets, how the talent in emerging markets is building a very rapidly growing middle class, uh, incredibly important. Ernst & Young has done some research on this, and, and we see the middle class growing over the period between now and 2030, up to five billion people. We see the purchasing power and the demand from the middle class increasing from 21 trillion U.S. dollars to as much as 56 trillion U.S. dollars in that time period. I think this objective today for our panel is to talk about really two things and then branch into whatever topics and questions are on your mind. One is, how will we continue as a society to meet the needs and to meet the expectations of this rapidly growing middle class? And how will we make sure that we actually do achieve this rapidly growing middle class because it is so important? Um, we've got a great panel here. I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves in just a, 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 a one-minute intro. You know, your name, what you do. If you're so inclined, share something about yourself that the audience doesn't know. Make it fun. Um, Gail, why don't we start with you? We'll just go down this way. Um, my name is Gail Becker, and I am the chair for Canada and Latin America and the West Coast of the United States for Edelman. We are a global public relations firm. Uh, we have about 62 offices around the world, including a strong presence in Latin America. Um, my name is uh, Hernando de Soto. I'm Peruvian. I uh, chair a, a think tank, which doesn't think too much lately, but acts in different parts of the world. Um, I come from Arequipa. We're all middle class. <laughs> my, my name is Augusto de la Torre. I am the chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank. Uh, I guess one of the reasons why I'm here is that my office uh, last year published a report, the name of which is uh, Economic Mobility and the Rise of the Latin American Middle Class. So we are responsible for the percentages that you might see around here. My name is Carl Lippert. I'm from a beer company called Seb Miller. Um, I'm a president for Latin America. I, um, I must confess up front that we love this topic of the middle class. We have a different definition from the World Bank as to who the middle class is for us. Everybody who drinks beer is considered the middle class. We're happy to talk about this topic today. <laughs> Uh, my name is Marcelo Neri. I'm uh, the Minister of Strategic Affairs in Brazil, also the president of uh, Institute of La Applied Research, IPEA. Um, I'm a professor at Fundação Getúlio Vargas, where we did some research on the, the so-called Brazilian new middle class. Uh, I agree completely. Everyone thinks it's middle class, so I think this is a very interesting. It's different from the poor. You know, when we talk about the poor, we, we talk about someone else. When we talk about middle class, everyone thinks him, him or herself as middle class. So it's interesting. Well, thank you all. We, uh, as I said, the minister will be joining us, and we would have turned to him first. But Augusto, maybe I'll turn to you first, since at the World Bank you have researched this. You've looked across Latin America for some time. You know, what have been the key drivers of this middle class growth, and, and how do we make sure it continues? Uh, with respect to the drivers, one might classify them between two, two big groups. One has to do with the dynamics of employment and economic growth uh, and what happens in labor markets in particular. And the other has to do with redistributional and social policies. Uh, on a fairly uh, first approximation, our estimate is that growth and employment played a much larger role in the growth of the middle class over the past 10 years than redistribution. Redistribution and social policies played a bigger role in terms of people leaving poverty. And you, we, might, we have to remember that more than 70 million Latin Americans have left poverty over the last 10 years, so it has been a major poverty reduction decade. 
About 50 million Latin Americans enter our definition of the middle class, which is, of course, somewhat arbitrary, and we can discuss that. And that was driven more by employment dynamics, growth dynamics. Uh, one can also argue that uh, the expansion of consumer credit may have also helped. And in some countries, the, uh, the strong uh, influx of, of remittances may have also, also helped. Uh, these are the drivers, and the, what, what's, I think, very significant is that those drivers were dimmed, but they were present in the 1990s, and yet we didn't have the type of social progress we had in the 2000s. So there was something in the 2000s that uh, clicked, and obviously uh, growth may be one of them, and that's why people, people have asked often how sustainable is this phenomenon, given that the last 10 years were the result of a significant amount of good luck. We argue that there were also some good policies now and then, but good luck played a big role, particularly commodity price boom, and you had a, a incorporation of China into the world economy as a big uh, uh, partner for Latin America, particularly South America, and then you had this very liquid uh, financial international environment that may have helped. So the question before us is whether this pace of, uh, of social transformation and growth in the middle class may rise. Final point. We do record and document a big expansion of the middle class. That doesn't mean that Latin America is a middle class region. It is a middle income region. And there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between being middle income and being middle class. In fact, if you look at the map of countries classified by per capita income, you will see many middle income countries, but very few of them can be considered middle class if, for instance, you say a middle class society is a society where at least 40% of the population, 50% of the population is middle class by some accepted definition. You know, thank you. you. You raised a lot of really provocative thoughts in, in that response. You know, the importance of employment versus policies, the importance of, of, of consumer credit difference between middle income and, and middle class. And Mr. Minister, thank you for joining us. We, we were asked to go ahead and start. I'll come to you in a second as you feel the flow. Um, Hernando, maybe I'll come to you because when I, when I heard Gusto speak about credit, when I think about middle class, I think so much about the work that you've done. You know, it, it raises issues of informal versus formal economy. Just re react to some of the things you've heard so far. Well, I saw you jotting down notes frantically. Yes, yes, yes. Short memory as time goes by. <laughs> so, I uh, know I thought the definitions of Augusto were very helpful. I think the, the crucial definition is that he said, let's make a difference between income and uh, sustainability. I mean, it, it might not only be about income. <laughs> and in fact, you know, if you, uh, if you read into the Industrial Revolution, which is when the West gets a sizable middle class, it is the result of a large part of the population that is needed to administrate the division of labor. So, in effect, as we scale up, as we start producing not only for local, but we start producing for mass markets, which comes with globalization, that creates a stable structure for the middle class, because the middle class complies with all that intermediation which you know comes across when you see the United States and you say, wow, this is the biggest agricultural producing country in the world. How many people involved in agriculture? 1%. <laughs> and then everybody says, my God, we've got a problem here. Our manufacturing is going down 12%. What's the rest? The rest is administrating the division of labor, the division of knowledge, etc. So that is what would seem to me to give stability uh, to the middle class. Then the question would be, applying this to countries like Peru or areas of Latin America, how important is that middle class that's been growing in sustainable terms? And the reply may be, as you talked about in terms of informality, that it can come and go any time. Uh, our rural areas, for example, where in Peru we've been, where a lot of our wealth is coming, from, uh, from minerals that were being f found, or the coast where there's agriculture taking place, while there is another structure, las comunidades, the communities and the tribes, there will be no middle class, because the middle class involves uh, scale. 
The average community in Peru, there must be about uh, 8 million people living in communities. Maybe uh, there are 8,000 communities. And roughly that gives you 220 people per community, which is uh, more or less the amount of people that fit in the Land Peru flight from Lima to Miami. So you've got 8,000 governments in Peru that are structured in such a way that there's not going to be a middle class. Why am I saying this? It's because if you want a middle class to grow, it's got to come from someplace. So either Cuban style, you take the guys from the top down, or you take the guys from the bottom up. So we can't keep on looking at communities in Peru as simply a touristic attraction or something that keeps the faculty of anthropology going. So now, why is this also important? Because if you look throughout the world, the guys who are now rising in the Arab Spring and marching in the streets by the millions, we've been working there, as you know, for about, with, with four governments, are about 400 million people aspiring to be middle class, but that work in small little covets where there is no connection whatsoever. And they all, they're all businessmen. I mean, all the guys who lit up are businessmen. So one thing that, it, that tells you is people do want to be middle class, but it's not going to happen unless you break some structures. Second, you mentioned China, uh, Augusto, which is important. According to Chinese official statistics, their statistics, uh, there were 120,000 revolts by farmers against middle class people of the Communist Party with over 15,000 police casualties only last year. So it isn't set. When we get all proud about India, my God, nanotechnology, information technology, there you've got a big middle class of about 60 million people in a country of 1 billion, 100 million people. In China's, in India still, about 56% of them have as a prime source of energy cow dung. So this middle class thing is important, but it's not going to work unless you destroy the underclasses and their structures or the upper classes. You know, it's, uh, it's an interesting juxtaposition when you talk about two ways to get a building middle class, either you know, build it from below or, or move it down from above. I, I know how most of us would, would see this. Uh, Mr. Minister, it is great to have you here and thank you for hosting us here in Peru. It's been a wonderful World Economic Forum. You know, the topic being, how do we make sure we meet the needs of the middle class? How do we make sure we continue growing the middle class? Maybe just share some thoughts you know, from the government perspective on, on what economies can do to, to address this and, and to make it sustainable. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, I'm, I do, uh, I'm sorry for my uh, the tardiness. I was uh, with uh, ministers from the Alliance of the Pacific uh, and we were discussing um, ways to further our integration. So um, it was a good reason to be late, so I apologize. Uh, I, I think that this discussion is, is very relevant and it goes beyond the uh, uh, economic uh, dimensions. It goes, has social, political implications as well. Uh, addressing your question of the sustainability of the middle class, really um, uh, there's one thing that will make it sustainable towards the future, which is growth. Without growth, you won't have a middle class. Uh, you need stability. With high inflation, you won't have a middle class. Uh, and I think something that in Peru, in, in Peru and in other uh, Latin American countries has enabled uh, a middle class to grow uh, uh, has been um, openness. Because openness, in a way, what has delivered is a dec the decrease in, in the price of imported goods. So now, nowadays, more consumers have access to goods and services that they didn't have access because now they're cheaper because uh, globalization has good effects in terms of uh, efficiencies and we can import uh, uh, more things at better prices and hopefully good quality. So definitely uh, for us, again, uh, without growth, without us growing uh, above 6% uh, uh, in a sustained way, and obviously this entails investment, productivity, uh, we're, we won't be able to sustain this, this middle class. And another thing which I think uh, is, is helpful uh, in the case of Peru and in, in this discussion, whether it's uh, bottom-up or, or the other way, uh, I think the nature of Peruvian middle class has 
may, may um, uh, complement what uh, Hernando said. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you uh, uh, completely. Uh, I was catching my breath while, while I was sitting here. Uh, is that uh, for us, we consider our, our middle class not to be of the traditional kind, but it used to be those migrants from rural areas that came to urban areas searching for opportunities and uh, and and those are those are the, that's the thriving new emerging middle class in countries like Peru where all the dynamism of our eternal demand is based the consumption boom the expansion of housing the expansion of micro uh, of financial services to this segments uh, is has been that way and obviously this because we grew and we had stable policies yeah thank you Marcello from Brazil um, you know, facing similar opportunities and, and similar challenges. How do you look at keeping, you know, this middle class miracle in both the growth and meeting the needs of the middle class? How do you keep that going when, you know, demonstrably we're still in the middle of, of difficult economic times globally? I mean, how do you see it? I think the battle for keeping the middle class where it is and to grow will be played especially in the labor markets. Um, the good news is that labor markets are still going well, at least in Brazil we are in full employment and that's quite a paradox since we had very low uh, GDP growth. But I think it's, uh, it's more in the labor market, it has been more in terms of formal employment, which I think was uh, genuine and important, the key aspiration of workers, not so much in terms of entrepreneurship, less than I would like it to be. I think what Latin Americans want, and Brazilians in particular, is to have a stable job. And, and this is what they are getting. I would like them to, 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 to want also to open a small business, to grow, but I don't see it, uh, it happen. Uh, just one small point with respect to the, this bottom-up or uh, top-down in terms of definition. Uh, <clears throat> I think when we talk about middle class, we talk very much about uh, a U.S. or European definition, where you have, you know, like two cars, two dogs, two kids, <laughs> and uh, I don't think this is a good definition, in my I'm opinion. Glad you stopped with that and didn't go to two spouses and two other things. I mean, so this. That's is, it. This uh, is good. <laughs> I mean, I think the, we are having already two kids, which are very important, you know, gives you sustainability. But, um, but I think if we look at, at to the U.S. and to Europe, we're going to see ourselves as poor. I mean, they are the richest one in the world. So, so I, I'm very much in line with, uh, with uh, Minister idea. We have to look, you know, within our communities, our countries, and I think if we do that, we find the world here. Because actually Latin America, in terms of its income and its inequality, very high inequality, but this is a very good picture of the world. So uh, I, I don't think we should import definitions from, from developed countries, otherwise we're not going to see ourselves moving. We are doing, you know, someone who incomes change from 1000 to $2,000. If you look from top, you see, wow, nothing changed in this guy's life. I mean, it's a revolution going on. So I think it's, um, and one last point, I think it will be very tough to, uh, to respond to the aspirations of the Latin American middle class because we have very high aspirations. Latin Americans are very positive towards their future, so the governments have really, it's more than, if you control by income, no one is more optimistic with respect to the future than Latin Americans, so th this is tough. Very, very helpful, and, and it's interesting, you know, Gail, you come at it as well from a different perspective, which is, you know, how do companies target this new middle class, however we define it, and you know what does this new middle class respond to, if you will, from messaging and product needs? And so maybe comment on that from Edelman's perspective. Okay, sure. So um, I agree with uh, what everyone had said so far, and I think you know one of the questions that I have is what is business's role in terms of 
in terms of helping to unleash the power and fuel the progress of the middle class. And I think um, Edelman releases a global trust barometer survey every year. And in fact, we release it at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And this year, if you look at the, it's uh, 26, uh, I'm sorry, 31,000 people, 26 um, uh, countries, and we, we measured three countries in Latin America. And I think what's really interesting when you look at those, those findings is where Latin America stood out in terms of the rest of the world is the gap between trust in business and trust in government. So to your point, yes, the trust in business is extraordinarily high, but the trust in government is extraordinarily low. And what that, and it's the largest gap in the world of all the 26 countries that we surveyed. So I think what that really denotes is a tremendous opportunity for business to fill in those societal gaps and to lead. Uh, and some businesses are taking advantage of that. That's sort of one opportunity for business. The other opportunity for business, to your point, is the way that we communicate with the middle class. What kinds of, uh, what kinds of things do they want to hear? How, how do they want to be communicated to? And perhaps most importantly, what is it that they want to see from business today. So when you, when, you, when you look at some of the findings and you see the, the importance of how they rank um, operational factors, such as um, having a, a good business, being on a, a list of um, uh, well-known companies, versus communicating transparency um, and communicating frequently, um, treats, uh, treats employees well, um, holds um, uh, um, um, profits below customers, um, on and on and on. People, the, the expectation for people that they have in business is huge, but the gap between what they expect and, their perce and, the, and the perception of what they receive is actually quite low, and that is a huge opportunity for business today to speak to these audiences in terms of communicating what, um, what it is that um, they're not getting. Well, Carl, you're communicating to, to the customers all the time, um, you know, at Sam Miller and, and doing a remarkable job of it. Um, comment on, on what you've heard from Gail and also just the environmental issues that, that come from the middle class rise. I must say, I, I strongly agree with what Gail has been saying about the role of business. In fact, I feel quite lonely up here representing business, I suppose. But, but uh, I think there is an enormous job that we have to do, particularly as, as companies that sell consumer goods, to educate. Because we have a, we have a new middle class. We have a, a group of people that don't know quite what is expected and how to fit in and what they can and cannot afford and what they should do. And, and we have seen in the last couple of years that their spending patterns and their interaction with, the, with society and the environment has shifted quite Profoundly, what we have seen is a period of low interest rates and strong currencies, and we have seen the period where the, this growing middle class now has been buying a lot of durable goods and semi-durable goods, so cars and appliances, etc., because they want the things that we have. They want cars and appliances. They want comfort. They want utilities, um, and so so they want those things. But we also know that as they want those things, all of these things are quite resource intensive and putting a strain on the environment around us and, and the resources. So if you look at the need for more infrastructure, if you look at the need for more resources, if you look at the impact of all of this stuff on the environment, it's, uh, it's a substantial thing. So if you travel up and down Latin America as, as we do, you can see how the rivers are polluted, you can see the forest affected, you can see pollution. There's a lot of it. And uh, it's deeply concerning that as people become more affluent and consume more, that they have a significant effect. So we think that there is a significant educational job that has to be fulfilled both by parents and teachers on one hand, because you know good practices start at home. And uh, it strikes me always when, you, when you're in the developed world how normal it is for people to have different garbage bins at home to separate their waste, something simple as that, which you don't find so common in this part of the world. But on the other hand, there's a big job for business to educate, and I, I actually think that there is, it's not just a responsibility, but an opportunity, because, because com consumer goods companies that educate the consumer, that offer them something which is advantage because of what it does in terms of sustainability, in terms of impact on the environment, is something um, that, has, that has opportunity for growth, and I think we need to educate on this. And I, and I think it's important for companies also in this process 
to educate through the communication of what they do. So initiatives like the Global Reporting Initiative, which, uh, which calls for transparency, that calls for, for, for access to information, that, that, that asks companies to calculate the impact on the environment, I think those things are, are really quite important because they have triggered so much. So if you look at many consumer goods companies today, they are doing serious things in terms of the impact on the environment. And, um, and we, as an example, uh, we set ourselves a target some years ago to halve the amount of water we use, to halve the amount of energy we use, to halve our carbon footprint. And we're making significant progress. And, and the encouraging thing is it's possible. And we're not the only ones doing this. Everybody else is doing it. So, so as this middle class grows and there's strain on infrastructure and resources, I think we all have to respond. I think education is important. But I think the private sector, the business community, by and large, can play a significant role. You know, I, I think your, your points are, are spot on, and, and one thing that the audience should know is not just Sad Miller, but South Africa has been real global leaders in the Global Reporting Initiative, and Mervyn King is, is brilliant. I, I've worked with him on the International Integrated Reporting Council, and I think that the efforts around what he is speaking about are, are crucial. A few themes, I think, came up through the, the various discussions. You know, trust in business versus trust in government. Uh, and I'd love to drill down and get different perspectives, so just kind of free flow this. Um, you know, I'd love to get into, you know, a little comparison and contrast. A few people talked about middle class definitions in Europe versus here. I was struck by, you know, full employment in, in Brazil. And then you think about, you know, 25% unemployment in Spain and, and countries in the southern part of Europe. Um, very much I was struck by the importance of education and entrepreneurship uh, and in how important those might be in sustaining continuing growth in the class. Those are any topics, reactions to these that uh, there's been spurred? And, yeah, Hernando. Sure, sure. I, well, it's interesting to hear somebody from South Africa talk about this because there is something that's very similar to Latin America and other parts of uh, shall we say, the non-northern world. Uh, and it, I suppose it applies to a certain degree to Brazil. And it applies also to Peru on a smaller scale. There's part of us, when I go to see South Africa, there's part of South Africa which is really Switzerland. It's California. <laughs> I mean, it's Switzerland with the Bougainvilleas. But there is a 70 or 80 percent which really looks like Nigeria. So here's the, here's the structure. I think an American can understand the difference that the, the minister from Brazil said, if you go back 150 years to the United States and ask what is the middle class, your middle class was in the Northeast and Billy the Kid and all the gold rushers and the guys, the Davy Crockett's that went to Texas, those were the guys that were in that 80% trying to rise. And the reason that they rose and were incorporated as our minister, um, Castilla has just said, go beyond traditional macroeconomics. You had to empower all of those people. You had to create democratic government. You had to listen to them. You had to adapt the law to their needs, which you found in the case of the United States by decentralizing, by creating property rights for gold mines, by creating property rights for cattle ranchers. I mean, if you actually, if you go and see four Clint Eastwood films, and you see the, you, the ranchers shooting up the miners and the miners, you've got a picture of Peru in our jungle. That's what it's about. And what you've got to understand is that those countries that were not able to absorb the middle class, like Britain, were for the poor, were forced to migrate to, say, South Africa, to south to India. It isn't that they were the great explorers. Actually, we Iberics, Portuguese, and Spaniards did the exploration. We opened up the seas. What you did is you exported your poor to all these other places because you couldn't create a middle class fast enough. And you still see it in places like Britain. I mean, you go and see the upper classes, the cars they have, they're huge. You go to the horse races, these ladies, the hats they have, they're huge. <laughs> and actually, Britain has a smaller middle class today than Germany or France. So the reply to all of this is you have to integrate, you have to include in the third world that Nigerian part, or it's going to migrate internally, or it's going to migrate outside. 
This is good. We're starting a food fight up here on the panel. And so, other comments? I, I just think that Eleanor was confusing Australia with South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, didn't, I missed that. He said you're confusing Australia with South Africa, but that's okay. Please, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to, to add a dimension which I think is absolutely crucial and we highlight in our report. You know, we are um, excited about the growth of the middle class because people have a better life. But we are also excited about the growth of the middle class because we believe deep down that the bigger middle class will make for better societies. So there's this, I think, correct uh, perception that the middle class is associated with uh, citizenry, that the middle class people are more educated, they have better jobs, they have a better understanding of what the common good is, and therefore they can push for better institutions, they could uh, uh, reduce the levels of corruption, they would uh, monitor government so that they produce better education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we did some exercises on this, and we, we found that this is not as simple. When you look at the world as a whole, and you do the statistics, you do find very good positive associations. Countries that have larger middle classes, have lower corruption, they have better institutions, uh, better government spending, quality, uh, more uh, uh, freer markets, better property rights. So this, this association is what inspires us, no? Uh, but we also found, and this is the troublesome part, that the Latin American middle class does not, does not seem to be opting into a better social contract. In fact, what we found was evidence that the middle class in Latin America has the tendency to opt out of the social contract. Let me give you a couple examples to explain what I mean. The moment a Latin American household becomes a middle class household, the first thing they do is they take their kids out of public schools and put them in private schools. They no longer are concerned about the quality of public education as a result. You go to Dominican Republic, the moment you're a middle class a family, you buy your own electricity generator because you don't want to trust public electricity services. So once you have your generator, you don't care about the quality of the public good of good energy. Or when you become a middle class in many Latin American cities, you try to buy a house in gated communities. They have walls, they have private security because you rather not rely on the public police. So you could end up in a bad equilibrium. So rather than what you expect, which is a middle class that contributes to better institutions, more public goods, more cohesive society, better citizens, you may end up with a middle class that opts out and finds private ways of solving their own problems, and their interests may diverge from the interest of the public good. Yeah, this is really interesting. Mr. Minister, I'd love to hear your, uh, your reaction to some of, some of the World Bank's views. Yes, yes, no, and we've been alluded, trust in government, so I think uh, yeah, that too. we've been alluded that too. Uh, uh, no, I, I totally agree with, uh, with, with uh, Augusto that this may, this progress may lead to, you know, uh, have this perversive effects, but this entails actually the government to have adequate policies, and what I mean by adequate policies, uh, effective uh, service delivery of, of education of quality, quality in health, security, uh, to be able to sustain the middle class. Predictable rules of the, of the game, predictability. Uh, because middle classes, what they love is stability, because they've tasted stability and they don't want this to, to change. And obviously transparency. So these are sort of the, the challenges besides growth, which I mentioned as the first uh, um, condition for, for um, a sustaining a middle class. But also let me dwell upon the, the, the fact that as we have a growing middle class, uh, the medium voter, the citizens, don't like pendulum swifts. And they start being less tolerant to experiments and they start anchoring uh, uh, reforms that sustain you know, their own existence, which is growth that leads to middle classes emerging. So I, I think, uh, and this has social implications, the pendulum is swifting less in countries, for instance, in macroeconomic grounds, because citizens are happy having low inflation 
and having jobs that uh, are generated in stable frameworks and environments. So I, I think uh, uh, a way to, uh, you know, avoid uh, or, or a way to boost trust in government is growth, but also trying to have a government, uh, the government definitely has a role that, that goes uh, beyond, you know, just uh, plain growth and, and employment generation. You need to work these uh, uh, things so to uh, make uh, these incentives be in the right place. Marcello, you wanted to add something? Yes. <laughs> I would like to uh, also emphasize the whole the role of inequality reduction. I'm not talking about redistribution policies necessarily, like uh, Augusto mentioned. There is no evidence that uh, the, the impact of programs like Juntos, Bolsa Familia, was not important for the middle class, but for poverty reduction. But we live in the most unequal region in the world. Inequality has been going down for good reasons. The labor market, uh, at least in Brazil, you see the bottom part of the labor market, people working and getting much higher wages and uh, growing employment, etc. So I think uh, even in, the, I agree completely that in the long run, growth, productivity, anywhere, including here, is the key. But between here and the long run, we have to address inequality, I think, and we, are, we have been able to address inequality. And I think business that don't look in the bottom part, I, I saw this in Brazil, we started to release about eight years ago reports on the middle class. Business didn't realize uh, only four or five years ago that there's a new consumer, it's not like the US middle class, it's different. Someone who came from the bottom has very high aspirations, but it's not like uh, he doesn't want the same things that I want. So I think it's, uh, but I agree completely. So I would add growth, stability, but also good inequality reduction. Good, I'm saying, in the sense that you have the good and the bad cholesterol. I'm talking about the good, the good one, which is keep incentives going, yep. but lowering, uh, you know, inequality in a, in a sustainable way. So Gail, Gail wants to add something. Then I want to ask one other question. Then we're going to come to the audience. So get prepared for the audience, Gail. Yeah, I just wanted to add. On Here you go. Wait, speaking on, to oh, this. sorry. I just <laughs> wanted to add on what you said uh, from the World Bank, which was so interesting in terms of one of the findings that we had in our in our in our global trust barometer, where we measure trust in business, NGOs. Uh, government and media and it's interesting because we look at two audiences we actually divide the findings between the general population and the what we call the informed public so the top 25 percent wage earners uh, consumers of media um, in each country and, and 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 most education and something that we found this year in the emerging markets was really quite interesting and we really saw it as somewhat of a warning signal to your point and it was that informed publics trust all institutions far more than the general public. And I think what you denoted was this sort of skepticism almost that is, you know, with, as, they're, as the uh, middle class is evolving and growing and reaching new heights, there is this healthy or unhealthy skepticism that I think as we all try in our own ways to try and fuel that growth really needs to be kept in mind. So, so here's my question to the panel, and you know, this may be provocative, it may not be, but can we have in Latin America a sustainable, growing middle class um, if we don't have you know, more advancement in gender parity, if we don't have you know, women participating in the workforce, uh, both the education and the workforce in in enhanced numbers. And how important is that to the sustainability of this middle class miracle? Well, <clears throat> I would, uh, I think the gender, uh, the gender agenda and all that is, is crucial, but I still would go back a little bit to the 19th century. In the 19th century, whether it's the United States or Western Europe, manufacturing had already started. People forget that in the 19th century already 40% of Europe was manufacturing. They were doing machines. Mm -hmm. What brought modernity was how many of the population were allowed to make the machines. It's only about in the 1860s and 70s that you can start making a corporation in the United States without an act of Congress. 
you need a lot of politics. So you empowered your people. If the idea was charity, Henry VIII started the poor laws. Mm -hmm. And he started saying, we owe ourselves to the poor, and we have to start to give them enough money so that they don't live, leave the hinterland and come to London. But Oliver Twist kept coming to London. Yep. So the reply to that is, instead of gender, you have to empower them. And in places like Peru, like Latin America, the majority of people do not have property, not the way you understand the states and cannot form companies, not the way you do it. So that way, the reply is you do not get a middle class. And, and the, by the way, the reason I'm asking about gender is there's a gender parity session that starts at 12.15. Other comments on this? I, I, yes. I think, <clears throat> Go ahead. I think uh, gender is key. And what I think in Latin America, what we have been doing as government policies to empower not only, not so much women, but the mothers, I think that what we found through these programs that give power to the mothers, it's really a revolution going on in the bottom part, not so much in the in the middle class. But I don't see. I, I think you know the future is of is of the women. You know they are more educated than men. I mean they you know in the labor market they get lower wages than they should. But that's a matter of time. I don't see you know in my country you know my boss is a woman. She, you know, she does, you know, I mean, she does a very good job. I mean, I think listening. the future is the w women. I, I wouldn't be, I, I'm, more, I, I'm more worried about other groups. I think, you know, we, are, we, we live quickly. in a matriarchat, you know. Thank you. Carl, then the minister, and then we'll go to the audience. But what, from what, we, what we observe in the, in the communities out there is that the women bear the brunt of the social problems and pick up, pick up the responsibility. The majority of our customers are actually women trying to survive, taking care of their family. And investment there makes a huge difference to the quality of the life of an entire family and with it an entire community. And, um, and so that focus on women, on the emancipation uh, in their roles, in their roles in society, in their families, that is, I think, a key area of, of investment requirement for us. Mr. Minister. Yeah, very, very quickly. I'm going to quote uh, uh, my boss, that is a man. Uh, and he says uh, that uh, when, when you take a woman out of poverty, you take a family out of poverty. And, and, and it's, really, it's true. Uh, and talking about inclusive growth, uh, definitely, because in our country, we've grown. They say that we are a star, etc. But people, a lot of people don't perceive that. And, uh, and so there's this uh, gap between, uh, you know, what, what it seems to be a thriving economy and the perceptions of uh, a lot of Peruvians uh, in a country that is growing fast, fastly, the investment is coming in, but uh, there's this perception that all the benefits are not going to the pockets of, of regular people. Very important. Okay, who's got questions? The audience. Right. Microphones, we have a microphone coming, right? Okay, right here to the front. Thank you for, for this very interesting panel. My name is Felix Maradiaga from, from Nicaragua. Uh, there is a general perception that the middle class in Latin America does not have the same levels of influence and political participation of compared middle classes, for example, in Europe and the US, precisely because a sort of monopoly of the traditional elites in decision making. So I would like to, uh, to ask the panel what kind of policies from your observations are more effective in, in, in creating incentives for uh, effective political participation of the middle class in Latin America. Okay, who wants to tackle that? Go ahead. You know, when, when you think about uh, policies that are appropriate for the middle class, I cannot think of one that's most important than uh, creating equality of opportunities. This picks up on what Minister Neri was saying, and equality is very high in Latin America. And we have been successful in seeing some reduction in inequality, and that has helped the perceptions and the aspirations of people. But in the end, what will matter is whether the children can do better than the parents independently or whether they were born in a rich family or in a poor family. This is what economists call mobility across generations. Yes. In our study, we found that uh, an interesting paradox. While the middle class has grown in Latin America within generations, this mobility across generations is still very low. In Latin America, if you are unlucky and you're born in a poor family, your outcomes are likely going to be bad. So the ability of little kids to gain independence from the family background 
is very low in Latin America compared to, say, Southeast Asian countries. So whatever we can do in policy that enhances the equality of opportunity for the poor, for women, for everybody, so that they know that their future is not chained to the background of the family where they were born, and through merit and effort, they can forge their own future. That, I think, is crucial for the sustainability of the middle class, for the involvement of the middle class in political participation, for the involvement of the middle class in the improvement of institutions. That, I think, is a big agenda. Augusto, I think that's right. I think one of the things, my observation in, in sort of breaking that generational barrier is really supporting entrepreneurship and innovation. When, when you're able to form companies and, and entrepreneurs can start things, that's how to get out. Okay, who's next? Back here, uh, about three rows back. And then raise your hands and we'll get a microphone to the next person quickly. So, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Luis Arulu, uh, one of the young global leaders, Peruvian, but uh, living in Silicon Valley and working in technology for the last decade. Uh, one question I had, and I kind of place around some of the things that were mentioned about income and middle class. At the end of the day, money and income is just a tool to get access to services, goods, and, and I'd like to hear from the audience, specifically the you know people from the business community and, and the Edelman uh, lady, on how does business can really target their products to a growing middle class beyond you know the marketing and the product development, but how to build sustainable consuming class? Because at the end of the day, the consumer, I mean, a lot of Peruvians keep looking at ourselves as you know an export business. When a country turns itself into like a sustaining middle class, it really is because they build an internal consumer business and a consumer uh, culture, which in a way sustains other businesses. What Ananda was saying, there's like very few people in the U.S. that actually produce. A lot of them are working for the producers in terms of like services, whether they're professional services, doctors, accountants, restaurants, and so forth. Yeah. Carl, you want to take it? Yeah. I'm quite happy to answer that question because I, because I think there is there's something important here, and that is, and that is the, the way in which a corporation, a business, roots itself in a community makes all the difference to that community. So if, for instance, you bring in new technology and new practices, etc., and you, you develop human capital in the process of bringing that there, you make a difference to that community. If you're developing your local supply chain, if you localize it and involve other people and are inclusive in your value chain, you're helping to reach many other people. I mean, just, just give an example from our, from our business. For every job that we create in our business, there's 40 jobs created in the entire value chain. So the multiplier effect is quite substantial. So the training that comes with that, the inclusion of the value chain, the way you deal with, with people, and then importantly, the corporate social responsibility program and also the, the corporate social investment program that you have with it makes a big difference. So we have invested for these very reasons quite substantially in entrepreneurship development, and we have several programs running across uh, the continent which have had an enormous effect in the creation of business and we've walked that path with people as they've gone from survival and seed capital to setting up a business to growing and ne needing more financing and putting them in touch with angel investors and supporting them through that journey. The, the way you commit to those things and the way you sustain it makes all the difference. So we can quote you many examples of how you could do that better but I think that's a big role for business. And Gail, you wanted to add? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question and one that marketers all over the world struggle with every day, particularly in a world where there are global brands, but in essence there aren't global brands because the same messages that you need to deliver to the audience in the U.S. and Europe is actually quite different than the messages that you need to do here. So I would break it up into, into, into two parts. I think one, there are actually you know, a list of probably 10 key things that you can do when marketing to the middle class in Latin America or other emerging markets. You can make the brand aspirational because there's a lot of, you know, buying detergent, it means a lot more than just buying detergent. It means sort of a, more freedom from actually doing the laundry in the way that, that, that it has been done. You can change your business model. You can actually um, make products, um, distribute products, let people try products for free. That's very necessary necessary as part of the engagement here that may not be in other non-emerging markets. Um, heavy mobile 
very important because that's because that is the society. So those are things, some just examples of things that you can do. But the way in which you do them, in many instances, can actually be more important. Um, social media, so of the online po population, Latin America is the most active participant in social media more than anyone in the world. Brazil, for the 65 million users on Facebook, making, face, making um, Brazil the second uh, biggest country for Facebook right after um, the U.S. And I think what's so interesting when I work for companies in the, based in the U.S. and based here, here there is tremendous opportunity for business to leverage social media for their own brands that really just is now sort of starting, not in the same way that it has been uh, done and has evolved in the U.S. per se. There is tremendous opportunity and there's a number of businesses right now that are just exploring this and, and really could be on the brink of something exciting. Brilliant. Let's see who else. Over here. My name is Roberto Teixeira da Costa from Brazil. I was the first president of the Securities Exchange Commission. I was a member of ISB as a trustee many years ago. My question is the following. Since our region, one of the main problems is scarcity of savings and consequently of investments. How this middle class should be educated in not only to consume but also to invest? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> No. First thing, um, I think we, we tend to think the middle class uh, more in terms of consumers. And I think the, the, what, what is behind it, you know, uh, as I said, women are having less kids, these kids are going to school, after school they are getting a formal job. So th there is a sustainable part that we tend to overlook and look them, especially companies, because you're looking at your own business as um, as only as consumers. I think there is what we call is the title of our book, The Bright Side of the Poor. You know, they're really going after, they, they want to, to, to go up. But I think in terms of savings, I think uh, I'm very negative about uh, savings in Latin America and Brazil in particular. We are low savers. We save one fourth of what China saves in terms of family. But I don't see any change because, you know, demographics, people getting older, the old save less. You are having falling inequality, the poor save less. Uh, you are having lower interest rates, uh, which is incentive. You are having lower uncertainty, like the minister said. So I think all the trends are towards low savings. And finally, people are still very optimistic with respect to their future, so they, 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 they don't want to save. But people do have, you know, they invest in education, they invest in technical course. So if we enlarge, we are talking about financial savings, but if we enlarge the concept and including productive assets, then perhaps you have a, let, a, a less a pessimistic picture. But in my opinion, um, that's a, a key challenge to increase uh, household savings. We should have a campaign for that. Uh, if, I may, if I may add uh, quickly to, to this. Um, for, for this, it's crucial to develop a culture. Um, and, and education is, is paramount to that. Uh, you need to have a, a, a culture to save, a culture to, uh, uh, to have, uh, don't foresee your future, um, to save for um, old age. And I agree. I mean, this is, isn't ingrained in our societies. Uh, if you have money in your pocket, uh, you spend it. And this is something that needs to be tackled through more education, more financial education, to get uh, more savings and to you know, uh, make this sustainable. With that, we are about to get the hook because we're running out of time. Uh, there have been a lot of different topics. And I'm going to ask just very quick closing comments of things that we need to focus on. My sense is from listening to this that there is a lot of opportunity, but that it's critically important that this golden triangle of the corporate community, the governmental sector, and civil society work together to address the multiplicity of issues that have been discussed. Kind of just going, Gail, I'm going to start with you and go this way. You know, Top priorities, closing thoughts, anything you have to say very quickly. Um, I would say uh, that I think the, uh, the opportunity for business uh, today in terms of reaching this middle class in Latin America and um, 
in other emerging markets is tremendous. Um, and um, when I think about the kinds of things that people in this market are responding to in terms of business, in terms of wanting, um, wanting more information and wanting more um, integrity and leadership in terms of societal issues, I think it's a tr tremendous opportunity both for the region itself and also for the business community. Excellent. Fernando. Uh, briefly, savings is important. But if you look now at the recession, for example, that you have in the United States, your savings are all right, but your private credit has completely dried up. So savings isn't only a question of thrift, it's also whether you believe in the paper that you're going to save in. So when all your derivatives have lost trust, your government has, come to have, has got to come in and has had to really put a lot of money inside. So it's not only so about savings thrift. savings is one. What are the other two? Real quickly. Yeah, okay. The other two are you need, we, we were talking about participation. Yep. You need not only to participate in elections. In the United States, you have comment and notice periods. You've got referendums. Yep. Not, uh, not a consultation, referendums. You actually enact local laws, even in indigenous communities. We have none of that in Latin America. Okay. We think of democracy only as elections, not participation. Yes. And last but not least, we sign free trade agreements with you, giving you all sorts of rights that we don't have inside our country ourselves. So it's a question of also looking inwards to have internal free trade agreements. Wonderful. Augusto. Yeah, the sustainability of the middle class is closely tied to the ability of the middle class in society of, of building assets. There's no better an asset to build than human capital. I think at the core of the development of the middle class is the, is the, is the education system, the acquisition of skills, and the quality of the human capital or the labor force. Together with that, you have to have saving instruments which you don't, don't have. As the middle class grows, one typical asset the middle class invests in is houses. Yep. That requires a housing market and a, uh, and a financial market that supports that. Education, saving opportunities. Thank you. Carl. Just one thought, and that is that I, I think in order to sustain the momentum we have in the growth of middle class now, we need to sustain investment. That's going to be harder to do, but the role of technology and investment has been to help us catch up in Latin America. There's a huge deficit in terms of infrastructure, in terms of manufacturing capabilities, in terms of, in terms of technical capabilities. And I think that we need to get clever at making sure that investment is sustained. I think that's right, and I would add, drink more beer. And Marcello. Okay. As it comes this way, you know, I have less options. <laughs> so uh, I would say that in the last years uh, uh, in Latin America, we, we gave the, uh, the poor to the markets. This was rather important in terms of keeping the wheels of the economy going. You know, grow, stability, and redistribution. Now what we need is give the markets to the poor, you know, better markets, you know, uh, better regulation, so they have, when they have access to public service in the private market, you know, health, health insurance, um, uh, complementary savings pension funds, uh, pr private schools, and you know, uh, these are better. Because what, what I see in Brazil is that consumer protection is a key issue now. Firms are getting bigger, and we, we, so we, we need to protect this consumer with better regulation. And the last word to the minister. Um, I totally agree with everyone, so uh, basically, uh, but consumer protection, but without being protectionist, which is different, and uh, growth. And for that, you need the government to enable growth. And if it's of good quality, even better. Many thanks. Let's give this great panel a big round of applause.